Page 246, Chapter 53, A Most Remarkable Man The French and Indian War began badly for the English. The French and their Indian allies were better than the English at fighting in the wilderness. Great Britain knew it needed Indian allies uh, if it was going to win this war. In 1754, representatives from seven northern colonies met with about 150 Iroquois at Albany. This meeting, called the Albany Congress, was an attempt to get the colonies to form a colonial nation. It was also an attempt to get the Iroquois as English allies. Ben Franklin took charge. He drafted a plan of union, but the colonies weren't ready to trust each other. They would not yet they would not approve the plan. While the Albany Congress failed, it got the idea of union started. It also got some colonial leaders thinking about the Iroquois way of governing. The Iroquois had six had united six tribes into a confederation. Everyone could see that uniting the tribes had made the Iroquois strong. The delegates to the Albany Congress knew, as they said in a message to the English king, that there is the utmost danger that the whole continent will be subjected to the French. England had to get the Iroquois to fight on their side. This was the, There was only one man who might make this possible, William Johnson. William Johnson had arrived in New York in 1738. We are on the first full paragraph on 247. At age 23, from a farm near Dublin in Ireland, when he first moved into New, into New York territory near Albany, Johnson met his neighbors, the Mohawk Indians, and learned their language. Johnson became a good friend of Tionaga, a wise Sachem who was called Hendrick by the Dutch and the English. Johnson soon learned the ways of the Mohawk and was named as one of them. The Mohawk gave him the name Waragia Gray, which means he who does much. Johnson became a fur trader and was known to be fair and honest. That was unusual. Many white traders tried to cheat the Indians. Johnson's honesty paid off. As a successful businessman and landowner, he became immensely rich. Johnson married Deganwadonte, the daughter of a Mohawk leader. She was known as Molly Brandt and was as bold as an, and intelligent as he. It was a happy marriage, and they had seven children. At the Albany Congress, Johnson led the British negotiations with the Indians. As Waragia Gray, he called a great meeting. Whole Indian villages came and camped in his yard. The Iroquois had no wish to fight a white man's war. Waragia Gray, he called sat at a, at the council fire. He listened carefully and spoke forcefully. He persuaded the, his Indian friends to fight on the side of the British. He promised that their land would be protective, and he thought he could honor that promise. A well-trained French army was on its way to Albany. W. and his Indian brothers prepared for battle. William Johnson had never even seen a battle before. He was on his own land with his friend Hendrick, some Indian warriors, and untested soldiers from New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and New York. There were no British soldiers. Top of page 148. What happened was outst astounding. The small army of Native Americans and American colonists beat the French without the aid of the regular British army. In London, people cheered, and they wept, too, when they heard that the old warrior Hendrick had died in the battle. The English king made William Johnson a baronet. He was now Sir William Johnson. Johnson's biographer said, Sir William was a well-adjusted European man. He thought and acted as an Indian. These two personalities lived together without strain in one keen mind and passionate heart. Major General Jeffy, Jeffrey Amherst didn't like Sir William Johnson. He didn't like him at all. Amherst was a professional soldier who became commander of England's forces and the northern colonies. 
He was smart and capable, but also stuffy and haughty. Amherst didn't think much of the American colonists, and he detested Native Americans. He really did believe they were savages. When Johnson was made a baronet, General Amherst was horrified. But Amherst knew how to use W's talents. He knew how to make plans and organize troops. Page 249. William Pitt understood that, too. Pitt was a foreign secretary, which is the same as Secretary of State, in England and one of the nation's greatest statesmen. Pittsburgh is named for him. Pitt intended that this war be won. He sent more English troops to the colonies. Then he looked at a map and he saw the importance of the St. Lawrence and Niagara rivers. Pitt knew that the French supplied their armies through those two rivers. If the British controlled them, they could keep goods and equipment from reaching the Great Lakes and the Ohio River Valley. The French would be like bees cut off from the hive, Pitt told Amherst. Take those rivers. Top of page 250. Amherst made plans. He laid siege to a French fort, Louisbourg, which guarded the mouth of the St. Lawrence. That meant he would let no one in or out of the fort. After seven weeks of being cut off, the French in the fort were starved. Louisbourg surrendered. The W and the Iroquois won a great battle near the falls of the Niagara River. The English now had control of that river. Everyone knew that the most important battle would be the one for the city of Quebec. Both sides were confident. Louis Malcolm and the brilliant French general had smashed the English when he met them before, but he was pitted against young England's young general, James Wolfe, who was also brilliant. General Wolfe knew that his best hope lay in surprise, so his troops did something almost impossible. They climbed the heights of Abram, Abraham, the cliffs behind the city in the dark. In the morning, the French were stunned to see the British drawn up on a flat plain behind the city. Malcolm and his men were totally surprised when the English attacked at the top of page 251. Both Malcolm and Wolfe were killed in the fighting, but the English won the battle for Quebec. When the city of Montreal fell to a force led by both Sir Geoffrey Amherst and W, it was all over. New France was surrendered to the English in 1760. It took a few more years for the diplomats to get things settled. But in 1763, the Treaty of Paris officially ended the French and Indian War. The war was very expensive. The British government spending rose during the war from 6.5 million pounds a year to 14.5 million pounds. Someone had to help pay, and the English thought that Americans should. As you will see, that the was beginning, the that was the beginning of a lot of trouble. So what's going on here is you know the colonists from England came to America. French people also came to America. The French people had the Native Americans on their side. Um, the one guy, William, he ended up being friends with the Native Americans. So he got the Native Americans on their side. And what happened is um, the English from England came to help the colonists fight the French because they didn't want America to be controlled by the French. They wanted to keep it English. So the English ended up winning, and now, you know, the, the England is in debt. Wars are expensive. So England thinks that America should help pay for this war debt. Page 252. 